We are in our series, Grow Forward, Never Give Up. The last two messages uh, were addressed. One was to grow through gratitude, and we took a hard look at that. And, and that sometimes is a very challenging thing to do. It takes a lot of maturity spiritually to do so. And then to grow through trials is what we looked at last week and the importance of the fact that we all will face trials of various kinds. They'll encompass us, and we have to face them, and that's part of being a believer. Now, today, we are going to look at growing through vision. Vision. And now, a lot of people talk about vision in a very positive way, and it is something that is positive, and we need vision to know where we're going and what we're doing. Uh, but some people have become addicted to vision, that is, man's vision. But when God gives vision, how do we respond to the vision that God gives? I want to say to you today, it takes faith to do that. But there's an element of faith and there's an element of fear that confronts us whenever God comes and He says, here is what I want you to do. So, if that is true, and it is, then we need to learn how to grow through vision. And so, I am through this text, going to share with us four-step process to grow through vision. Simply four steps. It breaks the text down and helps us see how God's people who were given the vision to go to the promised land, how they dealt with that. Some positive, some negative. But we need to learn all four steps. So I want to begin with step one, and that is you should believe God. This covers verses 26 through 29 that says this. They came back to Moses, and you can know the backstory here. God has brought them through the desert. They have been uh, released from Pharaoh, uh, from Egypt. They've come through the desert. The Lord has provided for them uh, by day and by night. He has guided them. He has given them the nourishment they need through food and water. He has brought them right to the edge of the promised land. They can see in, and they see it. And now he has called them to go in and take the land. And some spies are sent in, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. They come back, and here's what it says. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went up into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw people who live there, uh, the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amurites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. So in these first initial verses of this report, what we're seeing here is that they had been out exploring and verifying what God had told them about the land that they needed to go and take. And in their returning, they give a full report to Moses and to all the people. They are, yes, sharing the good news and the bad news. They're, they're sharing both. The good news was the land does flow with milk and honey. It is full of all kinds of fruit. They brought back evidence of that, pomegranates and grapes and other things. And they brought this back. And they said, look at this. It's amazing. That was the good news. The bad news was this, that the people are powerful. The cities are fortified. They're large. There's giants in the land. And they said, listen, these people are huge. Their cities are fortified. And that was the bad news. The people obviously hear this news, both good and bad, and the bad seems to trump the good, and they began to process. We know that in their processing of the news, they are focusing on the negative more than they are the positive. Caleb will come in the verses uh, in just a moment, and he will have to silence the people because obviously, as they processed the information that came to them, an uproar among the people began to take place. There would be some who would believe that God could and would lead them into the promised land successfully. And then the, obviously, the majority seemed to begin to believe that God could not, would not lead them into the promised land successfully. 
My guess is the reports that were given were given in a certain tone and demeanor. See, the ten who came, yes, they shared, and I believe they shared honestly, but I think that they shared fearfully. Their tone was one of, yes, God said we can, but, but guess what? The task at hand, the people that are there, the city walls, the whole thing, it is bigger than we can handle. In fact, what they're insinuating at this moment is it's bigger than God. But there were two, Joshua and Caleb, who shared honestly as well, but they shared what they shared, not in a spirit of fear, but in faith. And what's interesting is that the skepticism was breeding doubt and fear, and the majority report of the ten was superseding the report of the two. I think at this point there's a little bit of backstory that must be shared to help bring this into focus, to understand what's really going on here. Early on, earlier on in Deuteronomy 1, 22 through 23, we study and see that the people had paused and they questioned God's leading when it came to taking possession of the land. God said, it's time, here you are, go take the land. And instead of obeying at that moment, they paused. And they came up with a better idea. Instead of going immediately and taking the land, they said, how about we send some spies in to spy out the land? And most theologians believe this was a pause of fear. This was a pause, a lack of faith. And Moses agreed. He said, okay, that's a good idea. In fact, we know that not just that, he had okayed it with God over in Numbers 13, 1 through 3. And most scholars believe that God was allowing this in order to teach the people a lesson, that they needed to hear from God and obey Him immediately and trust Him fully and not question Him. So he allowed for the spies to go in and to check out the land, to verify it, that this truly was true and it was the activity of God, that this is where God wanted them to go. And I think at this point, we need to stop and just pause and ask ourselves the question, don't we as well pause oftentimes when God says, here's what I want you to do? When God says, here's my activity, here's where I've been leading you all along, Here's what I want you to do, and I'm going to be with you. And if you look back over how I've brought you to where you are today, you can have the faith to believe that I'm going to go with you no matter what. And that's really what the people of God needed to do at this moment. But instead, there was a pause, there was a question, and they asked that the spies could go in. And I believe oftentimes I struggle in that, and maybe you do as well. And really, it can come down to this. When we struggle at that point, it's really a low view of God. What we're questioning is that God is capable. He's able to provide as He says He will. I was trying to think through some different things in my life, and there's several things that I could probably share about that. But early on, I learned when God leads, He provides. When God called me into ministry, and I went through such a struggle to come to the, to, the, to the realization that I would, okay, be a minister. It's not what I, I really wanted to do. I had other plans in mind of things I thought I would like and that I would like to do and that I would like to proceed with in my life. And I was young. But God kept pointing me to the ministry, that that's His plan for my life. And I struggled in that. So I went to school and I got a degree in accounting And I tried through the basis of that degree to take several different jobs, and and Lord shut some doors. There were some other doors open, but even in the opening of those doors, He would use them to humble me and bring me back to the call to ministry. And I remember that time when I received that call to ministry again, and I finally surrendered. There was such a peace that came to me. But in the peace that came, and I finally surrendered, there was more to the equation that had to come. I finally said, yes, Lord, I'll obey. I'll go into ministry. I overcame some fears that I had and some things I didn't want to do. I didn't want to go back to school for another four years. I didn't want to go through that process. I wanted to do other things. But God said, no, this is what I want you to do. And so I finally surrendered to that. And there was a peace that came. And God said, okay, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to move. And you have to understand, as a young man, this was a big deal for me. It wouldn't be today as much 
But as a young man, he said, I want you to move away from your family 1,200 miles away to go to seminary and to serve me in a church. And to me, that was final. That meant when you moved, you sell everything you have, and that's exactly what I did. I sold everything. I sold my car. I sold everything I owned. I didn't know, listen, I didn't own much, but I sold everything I had. And I got on a plane with my, with my two bags, and I flew to Texas, and I got off the plane at DFW, and I remember the pastor that came where I was going to serve in his church. He pulled up in a little brown truck and picked me up. And I thought, here we go. I remember feeling so lonely on that plane. But God reassured me, Mark, I'm with you. And he was. And I began a journey 1,200 miles from home, first time I'd ever fully left my family. And here I was walking in the path of God. And there were challenges ahead. There was ministry to be done. There was enrolling in seminary and taking classes and doing things that were hard for me. You know what I'm saying? That I, that I wasn't sure I could accomplish, but God gave me the strength to do it. So there was challenges. Once obedience came, there were challenges in front of me that God proved himself faithful to meet my every need is what I want you to grasp. He had a wife for me. Michelle was there in Texas. He had to take me 1,200 miles to meet her two years after I'd been there. And that's how God works. But my point is, is that when the surrender came, then I began to, yes, have peace, but there were challenges ahead that I had to trust in the faithfulness of God. Now, that's an individual story. But for, the, for God's people, he had brought them to where they were. They needed to come to a point of surrender so they could go into the promised land. But even in going into the promised land, God was saying, I will meet your needs. Yes, there'll be challenges. Yes, there'll be giants. Yes, the walls are big. Yes, it is fortified. And there are some good things as well. Yes, it flows with milk and honey. And yes, there are fruit in the land. See, but... It, 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 but you're going to trust me, and I'm going to be faithful to you if you fulfill my will. And this is what he was trying to get them to understand. But the ten spies, when they came back, all they could focus on was the giants that they saw. When Joshua and Caleb came back, do you know what they focused on? They focused on God, not giants. They focused on the fact that God would be faithful, that God could do what he said he would do. And I want to ask you a question. If God is leading you as an individual to do something that he has been preparing the way for you in your life, are you believing today that he is faithful to take you all the way through? For us as a church, as God leads us, if he brings us to a point of saying, here's something God wants us to do, are we willing to say, yes, Lord, we know that you are faithful to provide for us all the way through? That's the real question. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 19 through 33, this is a, another account of what had happened here. And Moses is recalling this. And he talked about, the, and I just, you, you can turn there if you want to, you don't have to, but just let me kind of, I want to note some things here that are important to see. He talks about the fact that God commanded us. He sent us out of Horeb. We went to the hill country of the Amorites through the vast and dreadful desert. So he leads them through the desert. He leads them up to the promised land. And he said, I told you, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. See, they come to the promised land. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. And he said, but then what happened is, this is verse 22, then you all, you came to me and said, let us send man ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take. See, I told you here we're going to go, but yet what you did is you paused. And you said, let's send in some spies and let's do some verifying. He said, the idea seemed good to me. He'd check it out with the Lord. But what happened is, when they came back with the report, it says in verse 26, but you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. When the report came back, you asked for the spies to go and bring back a report. They did just that. And, and we knew that God would be faithful. He brought us to this point. But what you did is, you, God's people, listen, they rebelled against God and His command. Now, let's not be too hard on them because we can be there too. We can rebel. We can choose. Even though God's been faithful to bring us to a point, we can come to this point and, and we can go, oh, gosh, I see what's coming. I see what's ahead. No, God, I can't do it. 
And that's a dangerous place to be. He went on to tell them and plead with them, talked about how God had delivered them out of Egypt, provided for them in the desert. And he said, then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did with you in Egypt before your very eyes. So he's trying to wake them up spiritually to remember how God fought for them right before their eyes as they looked and the Egyptian army came, the Red Sea is parted, and he literally just took them out. And they had a time of worship to the Lord and made a, a, a stones of remembrance. And they, they said, Lord, only you could do this. You did this, God. But they had quickly forgotten all that God had done for them. Fear was setting in and it was taking over. He goes on to talk about that, and he, then again in 32, he said, In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God. See, it was fear, lack of trust, forgetting the faithfulness of God. This is kind of the backstory to what we're studying today. I want to say to you, when God brings a vision to you as an individual, He brings a vision to us as a church, there is an element of change and faith that is always involved. For the believer, it is directly related to the leading and the ability of God to fulfill His part. That is the part that you and I cannot do. When I got on that plane, there were things, and when I, when I trusted God and I went by faith, and I'm going to move to Texas. I'm going to go to seminary. I give him my life. I have no idea exactly how it's all going to play out. But there are things that only God could do that he could put in place. And he did that. He did that when he brought Michelle into my life. I, if I told you the whole story and I've told you bits and pieces of it, I'm telling you it was the activity. It was something only God could do. I couldn't do it. I couldn't go out and find her. I, it, it was an act and a work of God in my life. And that is where the trust factor comes. There's always a part we can't see, we can't understand, we can't figure out that we have to trust that God's going to do. And that's the way it is. See, I really believe that when they asked to explore and verify the activity of God and God allowed it, it was what we would call a second chance, a second opportunity to believe God. God permitted it. God was at work in it. And even in that, there's an entire generation that would say, I can't trust God anymore. This is too much. It's too big for God. Man, I don't want to live like that. We've got to believe God, step one. Step two, we've got to go forward with God. This is one of the great, great verses in the Bible. Verse 30, and it says this, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses, and he said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. You've got to think about the context of this verse. You've got to understand that there's an uproar among the people. They're talking about the giants in the land, the fortified cities, the fact that they believe now that they will die, that God will not protect them. I mean, fear is running rampant. I mean, people are talking. They're in despair. They're planning and plotting and saying, what are we going to do? And Caleb stands up in front of them all, and he silenced the crowd. And he said, listen, we must, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Wow. I love this verse, because what I see here is that Caleb feared God. Caleb had a proper view of God. Caleb was not afraid of the people who were in fear all around him. How many of us can be moved by the fear of other people and lose our faith in God. It can happen in an instant. But the obedience by faith that he is demonstrating here, it is spoken simply and clearly. He said, we should go up. We should take possession of the land. We certainly can do it. That is, with the help of God. 
That's what he's basing that on. And you have to remember, he went in. He saw the giants. He saw the city walls. He saw the whole deal. And he still said, listen, it doesn't matter how big they are. It doesn't matter how many city walls they have. Listen, God is bigger. He's stronger. He's wiser. He knows. And what's interesting to me is that this is the right perspective. It is the right answer. But just because something is right does not mean everyone is ready to receive it or implement it. It's one of the things I'll just tell this to you as a personal testimony as a pastor. It's one of the things I've had through the years had to reconcile. It's just because something's true and I preach it, it doesn't mean I can force it into the hearts of people. Because I see it clearly, and I, I, I'm like, hey, well, this is it. This is right. This is what God's doing. And, and you proclaim it, and you call people to it, but you can't force it into their hearts. And that's where Caleb is in this. He sees it. He knows it. But the majority of the people are not hearing it. They're not receiving it. They're engulfed in fear. Watch step three. Don't doubt God, because that's what the people are going to do here. They have 10 leaders that are going to lead them to do this. Watch verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours the living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. That night, all the people in the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Watch how this whole thing is turning. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in the desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Won't it be better for us if we go back to Egypt? What? Yeah, that's what they said. And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. You need to understand what is taking place here. This is the rebuttal of doubt to Caleb's rallying call to go. This rebuttal of doubt, it starts with, we can't. That's how they started it. We can't. Caleb said, we can. This is like the David and Goliath situation. Here's Goliath standing so tall, so big, so, so proud and sure of himself and all of the armies of Israel are over on the other hillside shaking and nobody will go out and meet him. And the little shepherd boy David comes along who knows God, who knows the power of God. And he realizes, man, this is an affront to who God is. Why do we let this happen? And he steps up, makes himself available. God provides what he needs and he takes on the giant and he takes him down. You know, right? Fear, faith, fear, faith. And that's really what you have going on here. These 10 spies, they are spreading misleading, untruthful facts, bad reports about the land. They're giants in the land. They're creating a culture of fears, what they're doing. They're not reassuring the people. That's what a leader does. They re, we, you, you are to reassure people of the faithfulness and the power of God. And said what they are doing is igniting fear among the people. And fear is a powerful motivator. They use the grasshopper mentality approach. They said, we're like grasshoppers. They're giants, we're grasshoppers. That's how we look to them and they look to us. I'm telling you, we're like grasshoppers. And the grasshopper mentality spread among all the people. And they were looking at each other and saying, we're grasshoppers. You're a grasshopper. I'm a grasshopper. We're all grasshoppers. And grasshoppers die in the midst of giants. And giants just step on grasshoppers. This is a terrible day. We're grasshoppers. And they're all in despair over the grasshopper mentality. Grasshopper mentality forgets about the greatness of God and the faithfulness of God through all that he's brought them through. Here's what these ten spies had accomplished among the people. The Scripture tells us there was loud speaking, there was loud weeping that turned to loud grumbling against Moses and Aaron. Their conclusion was, uh, wish we had died in Egypt or in the desert. 
They're assuming defeat before it ever happens. And they should not put this on God because God never said that would happen. God said he would lead them victoriously. But they're putting it on God. What they're saying, they're turning the whole deal. And that's what fear does to us. They're saying God is going to allow us to die. God never said that. God said, I'll protect you. I'll bring you along. I'll meet your every need. But they've tur- fear causes you to question God, turn on God, and say that God's going to do something that God is not going to do. You see, you see the danger of it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. They said, we will die and our families will be destroyed. So often, if we can't see how to go forward, we long to go backwards. They said, give us a leader. Give us a leader that doesn't hear from God and wants to go backwards. <laughs> That's what they wanted. Give us a, a backwards thinking leader. I don't know who signed, who's going to sign up for that job, but don't give it to me. I would say warning, warning, warning. As humans, we are prone to safety over vision. Vision grows us because it calls us to depend on God. Listen to the words of Oswald Chambers. He said, it is easier to serve God without a vision. Really? Easier to work for God without a call. Because then you are not bothered by what God requires. Common sense is your guide, veneered over with Christian sentiment. But if once you truly hear the full commission of Jesus Christ, the awareness of what God wants will be your goal from that point on, and you will no longer be able to work for him on the basis of common sense. And I think there's some truth to that. We'd rather, God, God, don't give me vision. That's too hard. I'll just serve you, and I'll talk about you, but I don't want to go forward for you because that's too hard. That's really what's going on with the people here. They had two options. They could go back or they could go forward. If they go back, what they're saying is we're not willing to trust God with the hard things of life. We want to return to what we perceive to be easier, a better way of life. You know, I thought about that. I want to go back and be able to dunk a basketball. Because you know what? I can't do it, and I'm not going to do it. That's just reality. That's just a silly little illustration. But some of us think in our mind to go back is something that it's not, it, it's not reality. It's what I'm trying to get you to grasp. I thought about the neighborhood I grew up in. I, I like to call this whole thing that happens to us what is called the deception of dreamy distortion. The deception of dreamy distortion. I like to think about the neighborhood I grew up in and how back in the day it was so much safer and better. And, I, and I'm sure to some degree, if you looked at the stats, maybe that was true. I'd just leave the house and go play, and my parents didn't know where I was. I was in the neighborhood somewhere. And oh, those are great days. There were no challenges, no, you know, you could paint it. There's no sin, and everybody was great, and no danger, and whatever. Then I thought about the time when a car came through the neighborhood and tried to abduct some of us as children. Then I thought about the night when my parents woke me up and told me to get on the floor because there was a domestic two houses over, and shots were being fired through the neighborhood. And I thought, well, maybe I grew up in a bad neighborhood. My goodness. Right? Let me tell you something. Sin is sin and people are people, but we tend to, to, to dream in a deception about the past, a dreamy distortion. And that's what they were doing here. They were thinking that to go back was better than to go forward. To go forward, now that can happen. This calls for an exercise in faith in God. For you today and for me today as individuals and even as a church, there is no other way. God is calling us to exercise faith in going forward. It's about trusting God, not doubting God. You know, I I believe the Lord could have just wiped out all those people immediately and they could have just marched in and taken the land. But here's the deal. If he'd have done that, guess what? Where would their faith be? Where would their trust be? we got to trust God fully. Because when we trust God fully, we grow spiritually in our understanding and acceptance and practice of the faithfulness of God. And that's what gives us the character of God. But when we begin to doubt, we start our desire 
to return and go backwards, not forwards. Think about it. For them to go back and to go back without God, they would have gone back into the hot desert. They would have traveled without a cloud to cover them. They would have no one to lead them, no manna to feed them, no water from the rock to quench their thirst. If they had made it back, which is doubtful, but if they made it back, they would return to an angry people who've been devastated by plagues and loss of their firstborn. I'm telling you, if they had gone back and if they had a return, it would not have solved their problems. It would not have been this dreamy thing they had thought it would be that it would have been better. You do better to go forward by faith with God. Doubt, it leads to unbelief, and unbelief blinds us to God's greatness, causing us to magnify our weaknesses, resulting in fear and irrational thinking. <laughs> it is so dangerous. You know, it's ironic. They said they played the card of their children that our children are going to die. But really what happens is they die, their children live, and they go into the promised land, the children do. Isn't that interesting? I want to ask you, what fears are devouring your life, your family, your leadership? What fears? Whatever they are, put them up against the faithfulness of God. Trust God. Don't live in your fears. The fourth step I want you to see is this, is you got to follow God. Watch verse 5 and following what happens here. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Japoth, excuse me, <coughs> Japana, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only, only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. This picture is one that is, you just got to kind of try to take it in. Here's Moses and Aaron. What do they do? They fall prostrate on the ground and they're praying. They're in anguish. They're like, oh, the people. Joshua and Caleb, they stand up. They tear their clothes, which is an expression of the depth of the pain that's in their heart over the people's unbelief. Not only do they tear their clothes, they begin to tell the people not to fear and to obey. It is a, a clarion call to obedience is what they're giving. They said the land is exceedingly good. Why would they say that? Because they are confronting the misleading information of the ten spies who created this, this, this panic of fear. They said, if, now this is a conditional statement that says we've got to be right with God. Stop your grumbling. Follow your leaders. Quit questioning God. And this is a note to you and I. When we are discerning the will of God in our lives, we should make sure that we are right with God at every point in our hearts our motives, our thinking, our desires. Make sure you're right with God. And then they said, the Lord will lead. He'll lead us into the promised land. See, this is where the following comes in. The Lord's going to lead. They're saying, come on, y'all, get this together. The Lord's going to lead. We're going to follow him. But they said, and they gave a plea at the end, do not rebel. Don't live in fear. They're begging them. They're calling them to this. Have you ever feared what God may ask you to do with your life? Come on now. Let's be real. Sometimes God asks us to do things that just scare us to death. We may have to give up one job to take another. We may have to make a change uh, that we never anticipated having to do. It may cause us to step out of our comfort zone into um, a path that calls for faith. I, I don't know what it is, but I know this. Throughout my life, I have walked trusting the Lord, and, and, and it is a blessing, and it is, it, there is incredible peace that comes, but it does not remove the element of faith where I take a step, and then I don't know what to do, and then God provides, and God says, okay, now, Mark, take this step. Go forward, and I'm not sure what's going to happen, but yet God provides, and it's just like that. 
That's how God's economy works. And, and I think he designed it this way so that we would fully depend on him. Because if we depend on ourselves, we think we're God. We make all the decisions. What's the point of having a relationship with Almighty God? We don't need him. But we do need him. And he puts things in front of us that are beyond us so that he can be God in our lives. It's amazing. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we are to walk by faith, not by sight. Let me just kind of tell you to stop and take this in, okay? Unbelief is what's going on here. Unbelief is a serious, what I call a root sin. Pride is another one of those. And the reason we call those root sins is because from that sin, uh, is birthed all kinds and types of sin. And unbelief is one of those root sins. It spreads like wildfire. It devastates other people. And here's the thing. And at its base, it questions, listen, it questions the character of God. It accuses God. Can you imagine? No, I'm not going to say, I'm going to question your character. No, I'm actually going to accuse you of doing something wrong. That's what they were doing. And then they, they accused him of being cruel and weak. And that's what they're doing. They're in their tents grumbling against God. And when they grumbled against God, they grumbled against their leader, and they said, give us another one, a different one, one that will go backwards. Unbelief is a devastating sin. I just kind of want you to, I've tried to kind of get my mind around this whole picture. And the first thing that I, that I see is the faithfulness of God. If this is picture number one, the faithfulness of God. He raises up Moses. Moses comes to Egypt. He delivers God's people from the cruel hand of Pharaoh, all the plagues, right? All the plagues. They take everything they own. The Lord opens the door. They all leave in a caravan of freedom where God is leading them out. They have a leader, a godly leader, Moses. He's performed miraculous, miraculous miracles. And here they are. God has provided. Here they go. They go down, they follow the Lord, they come down to the Red Sea, they think at that moment they're going to die, they look back and here come the Egyptian army and, and Pharaoh and all of his men are coming and God opens the way, they cross over, they come to the other side, they look back and they watch at God's amazing hand of protection on them and he wipes out the Egyptians right there in front of them. They are humble, they are broken, there's the only God could do this. They begin to follow the Lord by day and by night. He provides for them. He gives them manna to eat, water to drink. Moses is leading them. They find their way all the way up, all the way, right to the edge of the promised land. They're camped there, and they're looking over in, and they can see it. Their faith is being fully realized right in front of them. And God says, okay, go into the promised land. And there was a pause and a question. Well, um, I'm not sure. And they're beginning to forget the faithfulness of God. And they said, can we send in uh, some spies to spy out the land? I said, okay. And he checked it out with God. God said, okay. Send in the spies. The spies come back. They give the report. And here's the bottom line. They rebelled against God because they were full of fear, not faith. It was unbelief at that moment. And that's where they are. But I want to read a little further. I want to show you what happens. This is amazing to me. I've read it so many times, and I've thought about it so many times. When you read a little further, in Numbers chapter 14, God is just hurt by it all. And then you come down to verse 36, and he says this. So the men Moses had sent to explore the land. Remember, there were 12 of those who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it. That was the ten. These men, responsible for spreading the bad report about the land, were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. Of the men who went to explore the land, only Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jehovah, survived. 
When Moses reported this to all the Israelites, they mourned bitterly. Early the next morning, they went up toward the high hill country. Here's what they said. We have sinned. We will go up to the place the Lord promised. But Moses said, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. Do not go up because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. For the Amalekites, the Canaanites will face you there because you have turned away from the Lord. He will not be with you, and you will fall by the sword. Nevertheless, <laughs> never, listen, once again, truth was spoken. They couldn't, they're not taking it in. So nevertheless, in their presumption, don't presume on God. They went up toward the high hill country, though neither Moses nor the ark of the Lord his covenant moved from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and attacked them and beat them down all the way to Harmon. The ten were struck down. The rest who went up to take the land were beaten down. <laughs> because the Lord was not with them. To spread, let me just say, there's a danger in spreading false reports about the character of God and His faithfulness. Be careful. Don't do it. These ten who felt so empowered to stir up all of God's people and lead them to unbelief paid a price with their life. They had a leadership responsibility and they blew it. Then they said, oh, we've sinned. Oh, oh we've sinned. Oh, we're going to go up. We're going to obey now. We're going to go up. And, and Moses speaks to them. And he says, no, don't do it. God's not with you. They go anyway, and they get beat all the way back down. <laughs> There's something to be learned in that as well. What happens when the Lord's presence is with you, and you're in the dead center of his will, even though there are things that are challenging? When you read the rest of the story years later, the next generation, the kids they thought that would die, and they said, you're going to kill our kids, God. It would be these kids that would go in. In Joshua chapter 2, Joshua, son of Nun, would send in not 12 spies, but two. Isn't that interesting? To spy out the land one more time. This is where they encounter Rahab, the prostitute. The word gets out, the spies are there. They began to look for them. She will hide them. The men, the armies, they go out searching. She tells them that they've left the city. They, she diverts them. The city gates are locked. She has them hidden under some reeds on top of a roof. She brings them out, tells them the whole thing, and she says something that is absolutely amazing. One verse. I'll just, there's a whole lot here, but just one verse. Joshua 2, verse 9. Or let me read 8 and 9. She said, Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and she said to them, listen to what she said, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in the country are melting in fear because of you. Because of the two spies? No, because of what God was doing, he brought a fear on the entire land. Who? I'm going to tell you who became fearful. The giants in the land were fearful. Those living in the fortified cities with all the big walls that seemed unscalable to God's people, those people behind those walls were literally melting in fear. God had prepared the way they would go in and take the land the next generation would. 
And I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart that God would have brought the first generation in if they had not sinned the sin of unbelief and trusted what God would do in the light of the fact there were giants. They decided that it was on them and that God would have no part and that they couldn't do it and they weren't going to trust God to do it. Let's go back instead of going forward. And if they had gone forward, God would have done what only God could do and they would have melted in fear and they would have taken the land. I'm telling you, don't count God out of the equation because in every equation, he's going to ask us to depend on him to do what only he can do. That's why we must grow through vision. It's going to be okay. Whatever God's asked you to do, remember, he's going to be faithful to take you all the way through whatever it is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love the Bible. I love the fact that you write it for real for us to read and know and understand and live by. I thank you that you're a patient God with us. The Scripture says that. But there comes a point you hold us accountable. And God, it is my heart that we will not sin, the sin of unbelief, but we will trust you to be God in our lives in all that you call us to, all that you lead us to, all that you want us to do for your glory. And that in it all, we're going to be able to say when we look back, when we look at the present and anything that's out there in the future for us, we're going to say it's all you, God. We can't take credit. It's all you. It's the hand of God. It's the presence of God. It's the activity of God. It's your way, God. It's you doing it. And we don't want to leave you out in any way, God. It is just a blessing and a privilege to be a part. Forgive us for for succumbing to fear and the grasshopper mentality in our lives. Help us live with great vision on the confidence of who you are for your glory. Would you do that in our hearts today? For every parent that is raising children, for every home that is represented here, for every job that every person has here, for this church as a whole and the mission you've given us, whatever it is, if it's personal, if it's corporate, whoever we are, wherever we're going, all of it, God, we give to you for your glory. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we love you. May we live by faith, not fear most holy and precious name Jesus Amen. Church won't you stand would you respond as the Lord would lead the altar is open would you come and surrender to the almighty God and his character and his faithfulness and what he has for you as an individual and as a church you respond